Hello everybody, I thank you for being here uh, to hear me today and I thank the Competition Commission for inviting me to do this talk. I'm not going to dwell on the world view of the Competition Act or of the Competition Commission, but I'm going to talk about the economics. I'm going to talk at the level of economic philosophy and um, I want to make three claims. Okay. So claim one, competition is important. Let's pause to think about what we mean by saying that competition is important. I think about it in two ways. The first is that in the last 25 years, India is now reconstructing itself to becoming a liberal market economy. Okay? So like most countries in the world, we are now trying to become a liberal democracy and a market economy. But the heart and soul of a market economy is competition. Competition is the engine that if on one hand you say that the market economy and capitalism is the source of creativity, prosperity, freedom, then the flip side of that is these happy propositions only hold under conditions of competition. If you don't have competition, then I like to use an extremely strong word, you just have rackets. Okay? Without competition, it's just a racket. It is not going to give you all the good things that we believe will come from the capitalist system. So competition it just goes to the heart of the benefits that why do we want to do a liberal democracy and a market economy? It is because of the good things that come out of competition. And for precisely this reason, everybody in the private sector and in the government system tends to have a selfish incentive to create rackets. Okay? So, Competition Commission cases are fascinating. Okay? This organization is just so interesting. Uh, I advise everybody in this room to read a couple of their orders. They are, uh, Mr. Sau, uh, I was just saying that Competition Commission is a fascinating organization and everybody should read some orders. The kind of things that people do to try to close down one market after another and turn it into a racket is really interesting. Human beings will devote tremendous energy to avoiding the hard work of living in a market economy. Okay? So the greatness of a market economy is that you are put under endless hard work. It is ceaseless. You can never rest on your laurels. Every day you have to wake up, work hard, innovate, figure out new ways of doing things, reduce cost. That is hard work. People are very happy to instead turn it into a racket, to make one little monopoly after another and then settle down, have an easy life, okay? play golf, make a lot of money, you don't have to do anything. Right? I'm just saying this is human nature. So the interest on the part of private persons to avoid the strictures of a market economy are very strong. The interests of private persons are always one way or the other to make a racket. And they will always come to government and try to harness the support of government in making rackets. And I'm going to come to that in a moment. So this is my proposition one, that the greatness of a market economy only comes when you have competition. Otherwise, all you're getting is a racket. And we've got to be zealous on this concept that it is the competitive energy and the dynamism of the market economy that gives us all the good things that we aspire for from a market economy which is prosperity, creativity, freedom, wealth, all those good things come only when you get competitive conditions. Okay, proposition two, here's another way to see the centrality and criticality of competition in literally everything that we do. If we take three steps back and we ask a first principles question, why do you have government? Okay, so you can construct an, there is anarchy in Somalia, there is anarchy in some part of Afghanistan. So. When you go from anarchy to state, you ask the question, what is state and why do we have state? To an economist, the answer is, we have the state because uh, there are four kinds of market failures. Okay? That the uh, untrammeled organization of individuals doing anything they want under a state of complete freedom, which I would call anarchy, runs into certain difficulties that are called market failures. And there are four kinds of market failures. Okay? And this is a very valuable organizational tool for how to think about government and why do we have government and what is the role for government. The first kind of market failure is asymmetric information. Okay? So I go to a shop and I buy a medicine, but how do I know that medicine is not counterfeit? I go to a restaurant and I have a meal, but how do I know that they don't have rats in the kitchen? Okay? Only a government can run the inspection system 
can run the enforcement system through which the medicines in a shop will be pure. And that is the work of government to overcome asymmetric information. The second is externalities. I pollute, you get cancer. Okay? There's no way to solve this. The free market will not find an answer to this. You need a government that will run an environmental protection agency. Only government actions can clean the air in New Delhi. Okay? And you know how horrible the health consequences are for everybody. There's nothing a private citizen can do. Only a government can go after the air pollution problem and give us clean air. And this has been done all over the world. Cities have great air. It is in India. We don't yet know how to do it. Okay, third, we have a class of problems called public goods. Uh, public goods are things that are non-rival and non-excludable. For example, the criminal justice system. What is non-rival? When one more uh, uh, person, when one more child is born and consumes that safety of the criminal justice system, that does not reduce the safety available for everybody else. When one more child breathes clean air, it doesn't reduce the amount of clean air available to everybody else. That's called non-rival and non-excludable. It is not even in theory possible to exclude a newborn child from the goodness of the criminal justice system, from the goodness of clean air. Okay? So public goods problems are problems where you have non-rival and non-excludable. And only the government will do criminal justice system. Only the government will run the army and keep India safe from external threats. And that is why you need state. And the fourth is market power. That left to itself, the free market system can collapse into rackets in one part after another. And only the government can uphold competition. Okay? So why do we have state? Because there are four kinds of market failures. What are the four kinds of market failures? Asymmetric information, externalities, public goods, and market power. So I would just like to say that market power and competition is one of the four reasons for the very existence of state. And that is how important it is. That is how big it is. It is not a small, minor sideshow. It goes to the heart of why do we have a government. Okay? If we don't pursue these four goals, then we are really not doing what government is required for. And we in India, of course, do lots of other funny things. We should be doing less of those. And we should be doing these four. We should be addressing market failures. OK, so that was my proposition one, that competition is important. Now I come to prop proposition two. In many circumstances, stability is actually opposite of competitive conditions. Okay, so now let me go after the word stability. Okay, so for everybody in this room, all of us involved in the word public policy, in the world of public policy, we revere stability. Okay, you don't want a disruption, right? That's how all of us think. But I want to say, actually, in a healthy, well-functioning market economy, there is a certain kind of instability that is integral, that is essential. A healthy market economy is characterized by something called Schumpeterian creative destruction. Okay, Joseph Schumpeter was a great economist, and he coined the phrase creative destruction. What is creative destruction? That the market process is constantly throwing up new technologies, new players, and old people are getting pushed out. Okay? That, that is the heart and soul of a market economy. If you have a healthy market economy, you will have creative destruction. Okay? So here are the tests. If you look at the list of the top 10 players in an industry today and 10 years ago, and if you see too many of the same names, we have a problem. In a healthy market economy, you should have disrupted the lives of some of the top 10 guys of 10 years ago. It is a hallmark of a good market system that SBI is not the number one bank for 40 years running. Okay? If you keep on seeing the same name, SBI, 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 something has gone wrong with the working of your market economy. So the hallmark of a market economy is that entire industries vanish. So I want to give you a great example. I had written uh, some stuff about this long ago. Uh, do you remember there used to be an STD PCO booth? Right? All of us remember, you would go to a Mofasil area and uh, we would you know, step out of the train station and we would find an STD PCO booth and we would make a phone call to home saying, I reached. Right? I mean, all of us have done this. They're gone. There are no, practically no STD PCOs today. Why did that happen? Because mobile phones and roaming have come. It's a new technology. Millions of people lost their jobs. Okay? So I believe there was multi-million STD PCO booths in the country. And each of them employing two people because they would run long days. Millions of people lost their jobs because an entire industry vanished 
because a new technology came. That is a well-functioning market economy. New technologies come up all the time. And a new technology comes up, it just wipes out an old industry, and that's okay. That is the energy, the dynamism, the creativity, the wealth creation of the market economy. That is what is happening. So the hallmark of a good market economy is these constant upheavals. We, we look to new players, new ideas, innovation, new technology to disrupt the existing structures. And for all of us in government, this is a very difficult thing to handle because in the government system, we are programmed to favor stability. Okay? We always want to favor the status quo. Whatever was going on five years ago, we want to keep on carrying that forward. And all of us need to really wake up and say, that is a problem, that if you have the same names, the same faces, the same technology, it has a name, and that name is stagnation. Okay? So look back at the old USSR, look back at the old China. Why did socialism collapse? Why did socialism fail? Because it just turned into stagnation. There were powerful organizations. There were powerful public sector companies. They didn't allow anything new to happen. Okay? Look at the telecom revolution. Look at the old DOT and MTNL and BSNL. Okay? They got completely disrupted by new firms, new technology. Today, MTNL is a minor sideshow in the Indian telecom industry. That is the hallmark of a well-functioning market economy. But if we had done the old socialism, that we just keep on going with the old DOT and the old MTNL and the old BSNL, we would have just been stagnating like that. We would have still been running a village telephone scheme where the government tries to put one phone in each village. Okay? Where today, 70% of adults in India have mobile phones of their own. Okay? That is the power of what capitalism can do. But we should all worry about the word stability. Stability, too often, is stagnation. The heart and soul of a well-functioning market economy is creative destruction. We should revere and revel in the disruptive process through which new firms, new ideas, new technologies come up and the world changes completely. So as I said, bottom line, you see any sector, make a list of the top 10 guys five years ago, 10 years ago. If they're the same guys today, something is badly wrong. Okay? The hallmark of a well-functioning economy is market structure should change the top 10 list should change completely, then something is going right. Uh, let me uh, give you another characterization that we see all too often in India. A new technology comes up, the old guys get into trouble, the old guys run to MyBAP and say, help me. Okay? This is happening all the time in India. The established incumbent players are all your personal friends. They take the trouble of walking in the corridors of power. They come visit departments of government. They will always ask for rule changes in a way that protect their incumbent power, position, profitability. The little guys who are the incumbents don't even know you. And they cannot invest time and trouble to come and talk to you. So when a government officer is hearing somebody, very often the government officer is hearing the incumbent. And we have to be very conscious of that bias that the incumbents have access to power, the incumbents go running to the government to protect themselves from change. And this is a mechanism through which we interfere with competition all the time. And this is something that should change. My last and third point, that in this story about competition and creative destruction and its role in the market economy and its role in India, government is an important problem. Uh, government is an important source of anti-competitive forces and anti-competitive biases. Uh, this ha is happening in many, many areas, and I want to talk about a few. Okay, so let's take organized retailing. Who is interfering with uh, new technology like Walmart coming into India and uh, transforming the retail sector in India? The answer is government. Okay, and I would question the claim that we're doing this to produce a lot, protect a lot of little shopkeepers, I would question it at two levels. The first is, why do we want to protect a lot of shopkeepers? Okay? So for example, when more than one million STD PCO booths went out of business, you didn't think it worth protecting. So you know what is so special about some existing incumbent industry that it needs to be protected? And the second, by preventing Walmart, are we really uh, protecting the shopkeepers of India? All that's happening is that we are protecting Indian businessmen who are starting organized retail stores or Flipkart and so on. So it's not even like we're protecting the shopkeepers. We're just protecting rich people in India who are getting a head start starting organized retailing. And you know, does this make any sense? Who are we protecting? 
my second example banking banking is one of the most anti competitive sectors of india uh, in 25 years we have given licenses to some 15 18 new banks and uh, you look at the top 10 list of 25 years ago and today it is essentially the same and there are a million rules that are designed to rig the game there are all kinds of new industries that can compete with banking and we just use the power of banking regulation to prevent competition against banking hmm um i don't agree so i can we can discuss the detail but in detail after detail after detail indian banking is one of the most cosseted and closed banking sectors in the whole world that is indeed true okay and that is indeed a failure all over the world but i'm after the anti competitive barriers here if we enumerate the barriers here they are amongst the world but that point is entirely well taken um my third example is trade barriers um uh, in the talk immediately before this there was a lot of talking about global uh, procurement and those kind of issues and conceptually a great source of competition is foreign producers okay so it's a very healthy thing to have more globalization you globalize the economy more you're getting more competition so there are more foreign providers there are many sectors in india where we have just completely blocked off uh, foreign competition so for example can a foreign lawyer operate in india no okay so indian lawyers have blocked off foreign competition similarly